Hello, everyone, and welcome to the third episode of the Startup Boston podcast, where I interview entrepreneurs, investors, and influencers in the Boston startup community to uncover actionable advice and stories from their experiences. In this episode, I interview Ty Danko, an entrepreneur, angel investor, and program director at Techstars Boston. Ty started his career on Wall Street, then moved to Vermont, where he founded in 2000 and later sold in 2006 ESEC Lending. A few years later, he got involved with angel investing and has made roughly 75 direct investments into companies, including the likes of Crashlytics, which sold to Twitter, Codeship, Evertrue, AppQs, and Drizzle. Ty talks about his approach to investing, his tips for getting into tech stars, his decision-making process, amongst other things. Ty mentions lots of companies and blog posts, and I've provided links to them in the show notes, which can be found at StartupBostonPodcast.com. Enjoy the episode. Ty, thank you so much for coming on the show today. My pleasure. I really appreciate having you on. I'm excited to have you here. Well, I hope it's fun. Tell us about your background. I got out of college and did sports for a while and went to business school. And at, in business school, I intended to be a sports agent, you know, like representing Michael Jordan or whatever. And uh, so I was told that the best way to get into sports management was either to be a lawyer, which I didn't want to do, um, you know, bring in you know, massive, great athletes. I'm best friends with LeBron. You know, I wasn't. Or else be a some type of product manager and knowing how to, brand manager, knowing how to sell Calix Cornflakes. So I interviewed for a job uh, with Lever Brothers. And Lever Brothers is now known as Unilever. And they had all sorts of Tetley tea and things like that. So I show up for the interview. And I'm there, you know, in my suit for the 9 a.m. interview and then the 9.30 was behind in the 10 o'clock and they're coming from New York. I heard the train is late. The guys are saying, Danko, why are you here? And I said, uh, well, I'm here for the uh, interview with Lever Brothers. You go, you idiot, it's Lehman Brothers. And I ended up getting the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I pivoted, as they say, and worked on Wall Street for 10 years. Got tired of, of uh, the taking the 623 from, from uh, Chappaqua. And uh, then I went to the buy side, moved to Vermont, uh, started managing money, and started uh, my first company there. And uh, that took off. Um, we sold it. I retired, but I uh, flunked retirement. So I'm now having fun playing uh, in Startup Sandbox. So you started your first company, uh, ESEC Lending, right, in 2000? Mm -hmm. At the height of the tech bubble, right? Yeah, so, um, it really, originally we were going to call it eastsecklending.com, and just then all the things with .com started cratering. So we thought that's a bad idea. Um, but uh, yeah, it was not the most propitious time, you know, and, and timing. Um, though, frankly, we could say we did it exactly right because it was still, we still were able to get funded with lots of money. Um, but then uh, it was slow for customer adoption, uh, adoption then. Um, people were leery of any company that was this internet-y type of thing. Um, but, you know, that corrected and we did well. So how did you become an angel investor? How did you go from, you know, you sold your company in 2006, mm -hmm. right? And then a couple of years later, you went into angel investing. Right. Is that right? Uh, how did that transition take place? Well, um, I actually, I, I sold in 2006, but I stayed around. I was going to retire in 2008 and the 2008 crash came and then it was 2009 um, and I had this thesis that um, liquidity would be at a premium and that it might be good to invest in private securities because they'd be desperate for cash. Mm -hmm. um, in retrospect, I probably on a risk adjusted basis would have been just as good just putting in the S&P 500 and trying to lever up would have been brilliant back then. <laughs> but uh, So I started looking around at um, angel investments and I looked with groups and joined a couple of angel groups and it took me maybe oh, a year to really get going. So it wasn't until the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, I started making investments. Um, and uh, once I got hooked, uh, you know, it's, it's really fun. So that year, was that like your learning process? Well, I was looking back um, a, a while ago and I, and it sounds strange, you know, it's better to be lucky than smart, but um my first 10 investments, um, I'll never have like a better group of 10 investments. And I made all the mistakes you can make in the book. 
Um, but I was fortunate enough to like be um, piggybacking on other people that I knew and trusted yeah. who had great deal flow and all that other kind of stuff. And one of the things you learn as an angel investment is you need to spread it around and you just can't put all your eggs in a few baskets. You're much better off doing a portfolio and Diversify. spray and pray. And, um, but because I've been frustrated because I hadn't really found companies I liked to invest in before because they had lousy deal flow and whatever. You know, Vermont, this might be a shock to you, but it's not the center of the startup world. <laughs> um, is um, I was putting too much money into the deals. And as it ends up, the very first deal I put in, you know, I put in triple what I put in now. And uh, that ended up being like a 15x. And <laughs> so I <laughs> ended up playing on house money. So something like five of the first 10 deals I had all had successful positive outcomes. Wow. And, you know, that I, I promise you that I haven't had that record since. You know, I've got a lot that are still alive, but I don't expect, you know, I expect most of them to, you know, go belly up, just the nature of the beast. So is there a different approach that you take now than you did when you first started? Well, I certainly... uh don't sweat over it as much. Um, I, I should say that right now I'm actually out of the market. Um, mm -hmm. I um, I had was diagnosed with cancer um, back last August, and so um, fortunately that's in remission. But as I was looking over all this massive paperwork and all this yeah. jumble and tumble, I decided I can't you know have my wife stuck with all this, and so um, I decided I'm just going to do you know liquid mutual funds now. So. I'm pretty much out of it outside of either reinvesting in um, um, like a, a really close friend who is going off and doing again and showing support yeah. there or um, fulfilling capital commitments for funds I may be in. But other than that, I'm, I'm trying to keep it clean. Mm -hmm. But before August, when I was still back in the game, um, I think I would sweat it a lot less. Um, I make my decisions pretty quickly now. Um, you know, you sort of, does this interest you? Do you sniff right? You look at the team. Then I might make one or two calls because if you see something good, you want to share it, but there's always somebody else who might have a different angle on it. So I might ask another angel with expertise in that sector what they think. Um, but generally, I don't I don't really mind being, you know, first check or second check. Um, maybe that's why I don't have that high hit ratio anymore. But um, uh, I'm learning that, uh, again, sometimes you just can't predict these things of who's going to be good and who's not right what role do you like to take on as an angel investor are you more involved more hands off mm -hmm. um well it depends on what the entrepreneur wants but i um the last thing i think they most want is backseat drivers saying listen kid let me tell you back in 85 when i was doing this you know like you know is that you know 1985 or 1885 grandpa <laughs> um but I probably um, have my most value um, in the first month of of you know meeting a company, and that's just making introductions or ha you know having an idea or posing the dumb question. Um, afterwards, most companies will always you know send a quarterly letter updating, and I'll try to stay in touch with everyone. Um, but I've probably given all I have to give in an area. Um, but occasionally there'll be, you know, a company which you just stay involved in for years and years. Um, and those are fun. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's important to set the guidelines both, you know, before you start with the entrepreneur and you, what both of you expect from one another, you know, as is the entrepreneur looking for someone that's hands on or more hands off mm -hmm. and then making sure that that, that is a fit that works for you as well. Clearly. And so on the other side of the table, when I was looking for investors, um, in my companies, uh, you really, <laughs> you want to make sure the guy's not going to be a, a pain in the butt. Um, so you want friendly investors in your corner, but what you really want are savvy or value added people. So you might, maybe you want to have some, I'll just call it, you know, friendly money that they're not going to be trying to do a, a putsch and oust you, mm -hmm. you know, a second later. But, um, mostly it's finding people who, can add to the business. So um, for that very reason, I'm well, I think angel groups are really important for new angels to learn the ropes and get deal flow. And, you know, they teach you a lot and have you know good leads. Um, I 
never wanted to go to angel groups because then you have to say no to all these people who are just, you know, going to ask you a million questions. Yeah. So, you know, if I want to go to angel group A, that might be because I knew person one or five, but I wasn't really interested in two, three, and four. Um, so I think that is always um, where I can add value is if I'm early in the round trying to figure out who the other angels or VCs are that are right. And lots of times companies have to figure out, do I want angel money or VC money or whatever? And the answer depends on how far they want to go. If they can do something and do it on $5 million, they can you know, maybe do that in steps with just angel money. But if they're really wanting to go big, you know, you might as well try to figure out who the right VC is and not just go to the wrong VC and be wasting your time because they're a life science VC and you're a mobile phone play. Mm-hmm. So can you talk about the differences between angels and VCs? <laughs> That's the between your money and other people's money. <laughs> um, I would have a tough time being a VC. And uh, a VC is a fiduciary to others. And, um, you know, I need to answer to no one except for, you know, explain to my wife why, you know, we're investing in something. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, and accordingly... I don't need to take months and months of due diligence and uh, I don't have to take a board seat. I don't, I don't take board seats. Most VCs want the board seat. And um, if you're on a board, there's only so many companies you can do. So if you're raising a fund and you've got X million per partner, um, can they do more than one or two investments per year? Probably not because of just the other time commitments. Uh, whereas an angel, I think, you know, should be doing a deal a month or something like that to, mm-hmm. on the idea of spread it around and see which ones go. So since you started, how many deals have you done? Oh, well, it's a little tricky on how you ca- count in that, um, like at Techstars, I'm an LP in the Techstars right. funds in Boston and New York, and they'll do a dozen companies, you know, a time, and you may do four years worth of, of funds. That'd be, you know, 48 companies there. Um, but that's not really like I'm investing in 48 companies. I sort of count that as one. Um, in the same way, uh, I, I also moved, uh, when I was busy running my own company, I didn't have the time and I didn't want to be distracted by angel investing. And so I effectively offloaded it and went into people's syndicates on angel list. So I've got lots of little investments and I don't really know that much, but it's no different than having an outside manager managing that, but on direct in companies I made, I was probably investing in oh, 10 to 15 a year for five, six years. Okay. So, you know, let's just say 75-ish direct investments and then funds. And, and, the uh, you know, and, and sometimes on AngelList, you know, you can add those two, but generally they're, those are just small investments. And so you've had a number of, of your investments that have had exits, right? Mm-hmm. So of those that have exits or, or not those um, – have you seen any that have exited it that you wish didn't exit that <laughs> continued you know, on their own? Maybe you didn't think it was the right time for them? Right. Well, um, I should say whatever the entrepreneur wants to do is fine by me. And there have been cases where investors hold up the entrepreneur and say, no, 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 I want more. And that's especially the case. You know, the bigger the fund, the more the economics demand you know, big, big exits. Yeah. And I don't think that's an angel's place. Um or actually a VC's place. You should have tried to work that one out in advance. Um, but my um, my very first investment uh, via AngelList, so you know AngelList is sort of this network where you can, you know, it's sort of a, it's not like Uber for angel investments, but it's where the, it's just a matchmaking service. Um, and when, the, when it started, um, I had seen a blog post by Andrew Parker at Spark Capital um, about, um, this one company called um, Card Munch, which used something called Mechanical Turk to, instead of doing optical uh, character recognition for business cards, it actually then um, sent the cards out to India or whatever, and they had people type in the, the details a couple times. And it was a quick and wonderful way to solve the business card problem. And I, I used it for a couple months, and I loved it. I told everybody about it. And um, then I saw they were listed on AngelList, I said, oh, I'm in, man, I'm in. You know, I called the guy up. I was so excited. And we had conversed before. He goes, oh, sure, glad, happy to have you. And then the next day, I called him up and said, oh, can I introduce you to some other investors, I think? I said, um, 
uh, no, thanks. Uh, we don't think so. And the next day they had gotten a, um, a bear hug from LinkedIn. <laughs> wow. And so my investment was one day before it sort of closed off <laughs> and then it took a month to clear or something like that. So I didn't make much money, but, uh, on an IRR base, it'll never be surpassed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's like one as an example. But again, it's not my place. You know, so there's plenty more room. Um, some could go, but. You'd rather have the entrepreneur. It's their company. Yeah, if if they want to sell it, you don't want to make them keep it. Do you want me to right. tell you? Do you want me to tell you that you can't send your kids away to boarding school, or you must homeschool them, or you know, <laughs> or whatever it may be? No, it's your choice. So, as an angel investor, do you help the founders, especially first time founders, with bringing on new talent onto the company? Um, I wish I could say I did that more, and I'm certainly keep my my uh ears open um i can say that that is a great great benefit um when i started a company called by side fx one of my investors uh found me my cto and you know what a great <laughs> great value add that can be um i haven't ever placed things that high but you know i i try to make intros too sure uh so right now you're a mentor at uh Techstars, right? mm-hmm. Uh, did you have any mentors when you first started angel investing? Yeah. Um, again, it was sort of several. I, I belonged to a couple of angel groups and I sat in on most of the angel groups I could find just to sort of watch the style and expand the network and all. Um, and there was a guy named Michael Mark. So the first deal I actually um, invested in uh, where I was doing due diligence, where I wasn't just sort of going along uh, with others, um, Michael was taking the lead among the angels. And so I got to sit down and he was explaining to me all the tricky stuff about, um, you know, what options pool due to the dilution of the share price and all that. So Michael's a very wise mentor. And I remember going to his office and he had stacks of books uh, of, you know, he'd been doing this for dozens of years. And, uh, you know, before you started doing files, you had you know, paper copies of all the records, they're all neatly organized, like like an old law library. And uh, Michael was great. So what sort of due diligence do you do when you're looking into a deal? Oh, man. Uh, mostly, it's having conversations and talking. Mm-hmm. So uh, there was one deal I know that ended up pretty well. Um, and I actually never met the entrepreneur. And... Um, it was kind of called up next. And it was, again, it was a, it was a something which I used myself and I'm bad in directions. This was a early mapping system and you could, you know, walk down the city and it was one of the very first, you know, GPS oriented things. And, ah, okay, I can turn left here. And then the, the building sort of moved and turned and you could tap on the building, see who was in the building. So it was a good way to, it was way before Google maps and that. And, uh, I was able to see an inner, so I'm trying to do due diligence by, checking out what else is on there. And I saw there's this like one hour interview of the entrepreneur, um, you know, for a podcast that was specifically on um, mobile, uh, mobile matters. And the interviewer asked every possible good question I could ever do. And I'm <laughs> like, wow. And besides being a good product, which I knew and um, having sort of good business answers, uh, Danny Moon coming up next was able to clearly articulate what he was doing. And that's so important with a CEO because if you can't sell, you know, how are you going to raise money? How are you going to get customers? But how are you going to get employees to give up their cushy job wherever and join you as an underpaid, you know, person for some stock options? And Danny laid it all out and was persuasive. So I ended up investing in his company without ever meeting him. Um, in that case, I only met him uh, after he'd already exited. You know, it, was, it was funny. Wow. So does valuation play a role in your decision-making process, whether or not you want to go in? Um, it used to. It used to be a whole lot more important to me. And I would intellectually make these decisions of saying, oh, you know, $4 million pre, that's too high. And I still catch myself all the time. Like, where does this guy get off thinking that their company is worth so much? You know? mm mm-hmm. Baloney, come back to me when you cut it in half, kid. Um, but then I had an experience of the one that got away. And uh, I remember seeing 
uh, a couple of them, but there was this company called Misfit Wearables. And it was a repeat entrepreneur and he had a big hit before. And um, he, you know, John Scully was going to be, you know, helping to finance him. The old, you know, the guy replaced Steve Jobs and Mm -hmm. all-star cast. And he had, he had come up earlier with the first um, iPhone app to have FDA approval as a medical device and, you know, telemedicine, great entrepreneur. And so he's talking about this thing, misfit wearables. And I thought, well, gee, this is just, this is price beyond my means. It was like, he was asking like, I don't know, 12 or $15 million and just starting off. And, you know, I, I made other, I, I made a bunch of other recommendations here. She talked to this VC, but this is too rich for my blood. And, uh, however many hundreds of millions of dollars <laughs> later, I realized that it's all about the team. Uh, and it's not about, you know, the valuation. It's not just about the value. Yeah. So, yeah. Am I talking about IRR? No, I'm just talking about returning the money and um, paying it for quality is something I would now do, which mm-hmm. I I don't I, I mean I don't play in the C rounds and the later on things and follow on, you know after it gets into nosebleed country now. But you know first checks it shouldn't really be a problem. So what about like follow on um, funding? Do you actively advise your portfolio companies when it comes to follow on funding valuations? Yeah, um, I think my general rule, and I'm trying now, it's it's difficult to make this seem credible, but it's not to, to get too greedy. And what I think they should do is, um, Mark Suster, um, a VC from LA, um, wrote a post that said, you know, always try to get the upper end of reasonable, but don't go pushing to these ridiculous heights. Even if you can get it, um, it just screws you up later because – the most important thing, assuming you're going to be a big hit and you want know, to go higher. And if it's going to be your last round, fine, you know, get, go for the gusto. But if you try to get the highest possible valuation, um, especially if you start getting dirty terms with, you know, the investors now get special rights and stuff, uh, it's only going to come back and bite you in the butt because let's just say you're doing a, um, a convertible note and you say, well, I'll convert wherever it goes and you can convert it at, 5 million or 10 million or 25 million. Let's just say you can get it done at 25 million. Uh, and then your next round, when you price it, is going to be at 8 million. Well, if you'd priced it at 5 million cap, it'd be considered a success. If you've priced it at a 10 million cap, people will probably say, eh, you may not get filled. You know, it's sort of a down run. Well, there's nothing down about it, but it was just a, this fictional number. But if you price it at 25, people are going to say this is the biggest flop in the world. So you always want to have progress. You always want to be oversubscribed. You always want to have people saying, oh, I missed out on that deal and still have that success. That's why Wall Street so often underprices an IPO. You say, what's the logic on that? Well, the IPO is only selling off 10% of the float and the the, the owners are still locked up on 90%. They can't sell it for nine. They yeah. want the stock to go up. You know, This is just to make it look like it didn't fizzle. So, you know, that's a... You'd rather blow past the expectations. Yeah, you're not, hopefully you're not raising that much money. You're not raising more than 20% of your stock. Mm-hmm. So you're not, you know, if you're raising 80% of your stock, well, sell it as high as you can. But no, the idea is your company is going to grow, grow, grow. And if you finally finish it out, and this is the last one, fine, go for it. But I think you tend to need to talk the invest, the uh, the person down because they maybe have great dreams in their eyes. And... Unfortunately, the companies oftentimes think that I've got a conflict of interest, and it's easier if I'm not if I am not following on. Then they say, "Listen, you know, <laughs> I should want you to get the most money because then I, you know there's less dilution for me, you know. But it's in your interest to try to get the higher end of reasonable. What is that? Well, you know, the lawyers actually know that pretty well because they're doing deals all day long. So there are lots of ways you can get a good benchmark of what's going on." Let's talk more about the Boston startup scene. With pleasure. So how can a first-time entrepreneur get involved in the Boston startup ecosystem? Well, yeah. or how would you recommend that they do it? Outside of listening to your podcast? <laughs> um, there, I, if you just Google, you know, Boston startup news or something like that, you're mm-hmm. going to get all the same good things. There's, you know, there's press, there's... There's uh, Boston.com, there's Boston, there's Xconomy, Startup, Venture Fizz. Yeah. And there's a really good guide, um, which the folks at NextView did, 
uh, called The Hitchhiker's Guide to Boston. I think it's um, bostontechguide.com. And that just lays out the land. And once you get that, the biggest thing to do is just mix it around. And I remember hearing one entrepreneur once told an, a, an older neophyte angel who wanted to get involved saying, hey, you know, unless you go to the parties, you're never going to see the deals. You just got to get out there. So whether it's a mobile Monday or someplace, a thirsty Thursday or mm-hmm. wherever, and there's more than enough events. You could go to two events a night easily until you yeah. make, make the scene. Just get out there and get involved with everyone. Exactly. So um, if you're an investor side, you might want to go out there and, and um, check out the incubators and accelerators. So like I mentor, um, I'm just starting at iLabs and at Sloan um, program this summer, but Mass Challenge and Techstars. And in Montreal, I do uh, something called Founder Fuel. And, you know, and Simit, which is, you know, a medical device thing. Um, you need to pay your dues. And it's one of those things is as you get around, other mentors send you deals. So one of my, my best investments ever came, uh, I was invited by a fellow mentor um, at Techstars to invest in his company. And it was a skyrocket. Uh, not the least switch because the company got bought by Twitter and then Twitter went up fourfold. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so good karma comes around. Just get involved any way you're doing. And if you're so, if you're a company, um, if if you're a um, a college kid or whatever trying to get into it, volunteer. You know, as you know, you know, do whatever you can to intern. Just get attached to whatever good rocket ships you can find. Do most of your deals come through your network? Um, the ones that you did, yeah, definitionally. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't look through AngelList anymore, and um, again, I, I, I'm not active. Um, but you know, the fire hose, you know, gets turned on. It's, it's, um, you can turn it off. So one of the dangers, um, there's one angel named Joe Caruso who once told me, and I, I was getting a little bit of indigestion. I had got, you know, you know, bit off more than I could chew, and I was investing too fast a pace, and he said. You don't want to just stop for six months and not do anything um, because then you get out of the flow, you know, cut your, the size of your checks and stay involved. And it's important to, you know, keep your hand in there. That way you, the deal flow and the, you know, interesting things stays relevant in front of you. But um, for me, especially as being part of Techstars and I, I went from, I went down the stack. I started as an LP. Then I was a mentor. Now I'm on staff. Um, I'm not sure what the next step is, but you know, <laughs> I keep going lower. But we read a thousand applications um, for a class, and so you really get to have a quick. You know, the, the fire hose doesn't stop. Um, so at this point, um, I think most great angels and investors um, they're beating the pavement and looking at things at the source, you know, at going to Techstars, going to Mass Challenge, going to wherever. Um, but mostly they're getting qualified leads from their fellow investors who've decided to invest. And um, that's the best deal flow of all. Actually, the only thing better is from your entrepreneurs you've invested in saying, here's a great company. So um, one of my first investments from Techstars was coming called Evertrue with Brent Grinna. And Brent uh, introduced me to Nick Rella said, Drizzly said, this is the best entrepreneur I've met. And he was right. Is there anything when speaking to entrepreneurs, is there anything that will stop you from doing a deal? You know, no matter if everything else can be perfect and in place, but say there's this one thing um, that no matter what will turn you off. Yeah. Well, I, I, blo- I wrote a blog post once. There was this hot deal. Everybody wanted to get in. And they were in, they were in, you know, and it was going to be oversubscribed. A, you know, a thousand fold. And I talked to the entrepreneur, uh, the CEO, and he just couldn't articulate what he was doing. And that goes back and like, if you, if you just can't explain it to me and I'm trying to write you a check, you know, how are you going to get this message mm-hmm. across to any of those customers and employees? Um, so that's one thing, but assuming they can tell the stories, then the last thing is the credibility test. So if, they're not credible if they're not believable. And that could be any number of things. Uh, but mostly it's sort of the shifty eyes or the ideas that they're gilding the lily and they 
try to obfuscate, then just stay away. So I was reading your blog, and on there you have you have this this quote that says, "I especially like to find that rare combination of brawler and softy." Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Yeah, uh, well, I was talking about Phil Beauregard. Um, but that really could apply to anybody. I, I always like someone with something to prove or a, a chip on their shoulder. And, um, so Wayne Chang at, at Crashlytics, he had been involved in Dropbox and Netscape and hadn't cashed out, you know, and, and it was really frustrating and you knew he was driven and really wanting to get going, you know, so I would, you know, invest in that hunger all the time. Um, not that saying Wayne is a brawler, but you know I, li I like having a little bit of a hard edge. But just because you're a sweetheart, you know, doesn't mean that you don't have a backbone of steel. So someone like Katie Ray, you know, she is, you know, total sweetheart. But you're not, you know, when she is talking to a founder about issues, you know, she is going to get to the heart of it, and you know, she is going to show tough love, and. um um, when you look at people like uh, Brent Grinna is another guy is just a you know a puppy dog, but he was captain of the football team and you know crashing the line just blocking and grinding it out. Uh, that's that's what you need. And for that reason, I love companies with um, started by immigrants or oftentimes the first generation kids where the dad had been a doctor and then moved over here and was driving a cab, mm -hmm. and you know the drive from someone with that background is, you know, something else. You feel like as if like they really want it. Oh yeah. yeah. Because this is, you know, what do they say? It's a uh, 10% inspiration, 90% perspiration. <laughs> you know, someone who's just going to work their butts off. So what advice would you have for an entrepreneur that's looking to raise money? <laughs> Go get it. Okay. Um, again, quoting Mark Suster once said, um, uh, when they pass the hors d'oeuvre tray, Take two and stick one in your pocket, you know, for the <laughs> that hungry time. Uh, nothing beats. It should be clear that the point of raising money is not to raise money, just to get a great company. And if you can get a great company, right. it's just the beginning. If if your company is great, it will raise money. If you can get great people, you will raise money. You know, just being good means that there's that credibility and there's other things. Um, yeah, maybe you. Uh, it's it's more important to get traction, to get customers, to get you know breakthroughs or doing whatever than anything else. So if if someone's got a great idea, buddy, I've seen now I've seen that same idea twenty times. Mm -hmm. um, why you? But you can say I've done the idea and I interviewed these fifteen people, and I've got letters of intent, and here's the name of the reference you can call, and here's my prototype, and like no, yeah, you can do it. So. Don't just think about raising money. Think about what would you could you do that can make a difference that would make your life so much easier, and do it. And if you're really lucky, you don't even need money. You know, you the best financing of all is, is revenues. Yeah. So there have been a lot of great companies that were bootstrapped. So Wayfair, you know, is worth however many billion, and they didn't raise money until way down the line. Now, that was they were well off from having had previous sales. But that was always, you know, cash flow positive right away. So, yeah. So the, the execution is way more important than, like you said, than just the idea. The oh. idea is worthless. It's idea what, is worthless. what you can do with it. I remember at first, I, it, it didn't strike me like, what do you mean the idea is worthless? And then once you run your own company, like you see 50, <laughs> like TaskRabbit. You know, yeah. I had that idea. Or, or, or the, the Winkle bosses, like, well, Facebook was our idea. Hey, ideas are cheap, man. Yeah, everyone has you know, Zuckerberg idea. is the one who made it run. Uh, when did you first join Techstars? Um, I uh, I went to my first Techstars uh, demo day in, uh, I think it was 2010. And I was just blown away. I'm like, wow, you know, what level of, of um, great companies that we're in. And I noticed, you know, all these... You know, fellow angels were already in the deal before they'd even, you know, yeah, they had been there before. So I got to get, you know, I, I want to get in there earlier. And uh, fortunately, um, um, that was that next year, um, uh, Katie Ray and Reed Sturdivant, who were at Project 11. And so I had known them and, and backed them. 
they took over Techstars and they said, would you like to come in uh, as a limited partner? And that was like the best possible deal. And um, I think in 2011, I started hanging out and uh, Evertrue was the first company I mentored. And that was you know, a, a revelatory experience for me. Um, I went in there and there were all these wonderful, sexy companies like um, Ginger IO, which was is now on the West Coast, and they've they've raised a ton of money. It was this almost legendary class. There was probably going to be um, half of the companies are going to be worth more than a hundred million dollars, and one already did exit for that. Wow! And um, there are all these great companies, and there was this one sort of homely phone app, you know, and it's to get loyalty. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. You know, I I like the guys, but I mean, this is pretty boring. I want to do one of these sexier companies over here. And Brent, um, um, I, I asked him, you know, would you like an introduction to my kids, you know, school? He goes, oh, yeah, you know, if you would, please. And uh, I, I made the introduction and I talked to the school later. And um, I said, you know, you don't have to tell me. I, I won't tell the, the company. Just, tell, you know, was it okay for you? Because I was still, still new in Techstars. I said, oh, it was great. This is the first guy and wonderful. I said, can I tell him? <laughs> he knows it already. And then I made another introduction because that had gone well. And he sold this next company or the next school and the next school. I'm going, wow, you're like, it's like hotcakes. And he said, well, Ty, you, you know, you're going to your high school reunion. You said, you know, can I install this on your phone? So he installs it on my phone. I then show it to my alumni director and he wants to buy it. And I can go back and congratulate him like, wow, this is great. And he said, Oh, we're changing our business plan. Like, why would you ever change your business plan? And I'm giving him advice. He goes, well, thank you. I've, I've thought of that. And he was respectful. But here's what else we found. And, of course, he had found a better plan and a better way. And uh, just about the same time, I um, – but I wasn't still convinced. Of, you know, he'd, he'd done his homework. And he said, just like you had read my blog post, he said, oh, Ty – and I see that you uh, know those guys at uh, Card Munch. You know, can you get me an intro to LinkedIn? I said, how did you know that? I said, well, I read your blog. The, the blog was like years ago. And he goes, well, I, you know, I found it. And I thought, wow, there's 80 mentors he saw at this dinner. And he went back to look that up. That's really doing his homework. So I was impressed. And um, I made the introduction. Then I, uh, um, I was in Vermont because that's where I live half the time. And there was somebody who was a who had done my website, you know, who was a local college kid. He was moving to Boston. He was looking for programming jobs. I said, "Well, here are five companies, and uh, you can go to HubSpot, and HubSpot has a ten thousand dollar bounty. But um, you know, so if you go there, I'll I'll give you the you know you can have it. And here's this company, Evertrue. I think it's really interesting. And um, a week later, the guy comes back. and says, "Oh, I'm working at Evertrue." And I said, "Oh, wonderful." He goes, um, you know, do you have anything else? So, oh, yeah, I think I could have gone to HubSpot. But I said, hold it. You turned down $10,000 to work at Evertrue? And he goes, yeah. And I'm thinking like, that is a guy I got in. Good. So every year I try to find a Brent Grinna. So forget all the sexy ones. This guy who was doing the blocking and tackling was the most, mm -hmm. you know, best student imaginable. And uh, there's always guys like this every year. How has being a mentor at Techstars changed you in a way that you didn't expect? Mm. Well, one way I did expect it, it makes me a whole lot smarter. Um, it um, it had one negative um, byproduct. Uh, I got so excited seeing all these companies again that I started another company of my own, and that cratered. <laughs> <laughs> so that cost me a couple of a couple of years of my life, and you know, a good fair bit of change. Um, but there's nothing bad there. Um, it's fun. Um, and whether you get into Techstars or any other program, again, I do like five or six programs. Um, Techstars is my favorite, having done it the longest. But that's also the one I'm most involved with. If I was more involved with the other ones, I'm sure I'd have right. equally good experiences there. But uh, it, it it keeps me young. It keeps me up to date. It keeps me current. But none of that's unexpected. Uh, what What is unexpected is the friendships you make. When does the next batch of uh, Techstars start? Well, Techstars, as a global entity, has got programs going all along. Right. And so I think there's now 24 programs going across, you know, to just opening up Atlanta and, you know, Berlin and wherever else. Uh, but Boston's only doing one a year. So okay. 
Um, we'll open up the applications in um, late summer, and the program will start uh, officially in February. So what's a couple pieces of advice you could give to someone that wants to apply to that? Ooh. Um, networking is good. If you um, Again, imagine we're getting 100 applications for every one we take. And the quick way to get to the top of the pile is to figure out who's gone there before and have them write a letter. So if you got all of a sudden five recommendations, you know, two from investors, two from mentors, you know, another couple from alumni, I promise you we're going to read that one extra carefully. And the last one is, uh, you just imagine from our point of view, we're seeing sifting through all this stuff. Of course, we're letting good ones get away. Um, there's a video interview. And if you can just a minute, just to hear you talk, mm-hmm. just to see you, you know, there's, there's something valuable in that. And um, if you can make us laugh or catch us our catch our attention, that's always good. Yeah, be a little different. Yeah, yeah. So now I want to go into our rapid fire questions. Uh-oh. Uh oh, not necessarily rapid fire answers. This is like VC, uh, like uh, Harry <laughs> Stebbings' uh, twenty minute VC. Oh yeah, I've listened to that. Uh, so what's something about you that most people don't know? Oh, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. Really? So, yeah, that's, I mean, we should edit that out, but you know, I love, oh, yeah. I love me my pro. I've, I've been a pro wrestling fan for fifty years. So, who's your favorite right now? Oh boy, uh, uh, I really like Shinsuke Nakamura. Who is? Are you a wrestling fan? No, no, I don't. So know. he's a he's a Japanese wrestler that just came in the WWE. Okay, uh, he's got some good stuff, and um, I like. Uh, there are female wrestlers I never used to like, but there's again this one. Uh, one Japanese woman as well. I maybe I like just the Japanese style more. Uh, <laughs> named Asuka. I also like some of the guys who um, Ray Mysterio Jr. was like this five foot six wrestler who used to take on all the giants, and he was just like incredible acrobat. What was your first investment, and why did you do it? Um, as an angel investment or investment period. My grandfather, way back when, gave me Walgreens stock when I was. Uh, when I was uh, in fourth grade or something like that. Um, but uh, I also, I was a trader on Wall Street originally. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I think it was like Southwest Bell Telephone 14 and three quarters of you know, like whatever the coupon of, uh, of uh, 05 or something. I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, on angel investments. Um, oh, I don't know either. I, I know some of the early ones. Um, that I got through like Boston Heart Diagnostics um, was was the early one that I remember that um, made me realize that I didn't know half of what I was getting into and I needed to have good guides mm-hmm. to help shepherd me. Yeah. What's your favorite blog to read besides your own? Oh, that's that's uh, that's easy. I know that everybody's going to say um, Fred Wilson's AVC dot com, uh, and there's Mark Suster and Brad Fell and all these wonderful things. Right. But my favorite one is my son's. Um, it's he has got it two places, alexdanko.com, A-L-E-X-D-A-N-C-O.com. And also uh, on Medium, he is at Alex Danko. And he's a VC at uh, Social Capital uh, in Palo Alto. And he's got some mind-blowing stuff. So I'll, I'll give him give him my credit. Awesome. If you could have one billboard anywhere with anything on it, where would it be and what would it say? Ooh. Ah, boy. I think given the events in Orlando, I would have it. Um, right outside of NRA headquarters, <laughs> say shame on you, shame on you, <laughs> shame on you, ban the AR-15. Uh, what's your anti-portfolio? What are the say three companies or two mm. that got away from you? Well, there's um, there's a bunch. Um, two of them were like my stupidity, and one was my laziness. Um. I e shares, which is this very cool company. Mm-hmm. I saw, um, so I had met Manu Kumar, who was the genius behind a lot of these companies. He was Lytro cameras. He was Card Munch. I met him through that. Um, and he, e shares was, I think it was his idea. And I saw it before. There was just one guy he had hired in. And I don't know why I didn't do it. And I just didn't see it. I thought, like, how many startups are there anywhere? Because I, I wasn't part of this Vermont. I, I was in Vermont. I didn't see the San Francisco thing going on. So I passed on eShares. I'm sure that's going to be a monster. And um, um, I forget which other ones I'd said no to. Oh, uh, well, we talked about Misfit Wearables because it was yeah. priced at $12 million instead of $7 million. Um, 
But then there was a company um, here called Kensho Finance, uh, which is out of Cambridge. And it was right in my wheelhouse. It was talking about Wall Street tools. Um, it had a fabulous team, everything about it. And I'd been, I'd been told to get into this deal. And I had talked with the CEO and like, oh, I'm busy. And well, I'm not, and we like canceled like four meetings and I didn't have a sense of urgency. And then they were done. You know, what? And like, it was off to the races and I just was too lazy to make the time to see it. So, you know, shame on me. So what Boston startups right now excite you the most? Um, well, again, I'm not investing, but there's one, my hot tip of the week isn't raising money as far as I know yet, but it's called Astreus Technologies, A-S-T-R-A-E-U-S Technologies. They just won the MIT 100K uh, competition. So maybe it's too early to call them a company um, because they're really not going and getting funding. Um, but they are um, helping to solve um, a big scientific problem. Uh, they understand through, it's mostly Harvard MD, uh, MD slash MBAs with some, um, with one uh, PhD from MIT. And they're taking MIT technology where you can breathe on a chip and um, a ten dollar chip can tell you if you've got a certain type of cancer or not. Wow! And so, opposed to taking a you know fifteen hundred dollar MRI or whatever with um, less false positives, it's just incredible. so if they can make that work. So anything you know, right now, um, having had cancer, uh, if I could help them go to market, mm -hmm. and there's nothing that could excite me more. That's great. Uh, so just a a couple last questions here to close out. Where can people find more about Techstars Boston? Techstars.com. You can look up the city and find Boston and you can get to us. And where can people connect with you online? Um, I've got a website, tydanko.com, T-Y-D-A-N-C-O.com. Even though I haven't really updated in a year, it's got all of my, um, all my old You're blogs, but also has that. my contact information on there. Okay. Do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for people listening? Well, you don't want to listen to an old guy like me. You've already listened too long. So, uh, um, you know, just do it. <laughs> Whatever it is, just do it. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be posting links to everything that you mentioned in the show notes so people can find it. Uh, thank you so much, Ty Danko. This has been such a blast. Uh, thank you for doing this. Oh, it's been fun. Thank you much. If you enjoyed this episode, please go and subscribe to this podcast on iTunes and write a review. By subscribing, you'll get all of my new episodes automatically fresh onto your podcast app. So make sure to do so, and it really helps me out in the rankings and with acquiring users. Remember, all show notes can be found at startupbostonpodcast.com. Thank you for listening, and until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nick at startupbostonpodcast.com. That's N-I-C at startupbostonpodcast.com. Cheers.